there is a very quiet revolution happening in robotics today. That revolution will change the way that we live our lives at home, at work, and potentially will change the structure of our society in the future. But to understand this, I just want to go back very briefly and talk a little bit about how we got to where we are. Hence the reason that we have quite an old robot on the screen. This, in fact, was the very first industrial robot that was ever created. And in the late 50s, George Duvall and Joseph Engelberger created the Ultimate. By 1961, it was installed and working on the production line at General Motors. And all of the industrial robotics that are used today can be directly linked back to the work that was done and ultimately being installed. That isn't a very huge, huge length of time in the 60s. And one of the most interesting things is that this not only had a fundamental effect on the productivity of our factories, but it also, more significantly, started protecting our workforce from dangerous working environments and dangerous processes. As you can see, the basic structure of an industrial robot hasn't changed a lot. They're modern industrial robots that are available today, and they are used to produce just about everything that we use, be it cars, furniture, through the farming industry, and onto consumer electronics. I'm going to jump forward. I'm going to jump forward to the 1980s, the next big step on our journey to where we are today with robotics. In the 1980s and the early 90s, a lot of the researchers that were working um, in artificial intelligence started experimenting with combining their artificial intelligence systems with mobile robotics platforms. Now, it doesn't sound like there's probably a lot that could come out of that, except for things like that. For those of you that don't recognize that, that's the Mars rover. Something like that device, when it's up on Mars, when somebody says turn left, it takes 45 minutes for that command to get from Earth to Mars. So if you're heading towards uh, uh, a cliff or something, a 45 minute delay is not great. So these have to have artificial intelligence to enable them to manage and, uh, and survive in the environments they're in. A strange thing to put up for a robotics talk. A mobile phone, a smartphone a device that I would imagine the majority of the people in this room have got in their pockets. But the reason that this is important is that, again, as we jump forward to where we're going, the development of the smartphone and the mobile phone was key to miniaturizing electronics, improving the processing power, improving battery technology, and all of the things that goes along with that. That's what's enabled us to get to the point where we are today. So, what's all of this got to do with emerging cultures? Not an awful lot, really, is it? Except that the next step in robotics is here. So, we're used to robots maybe vacuuming the floor, covering those types of areas. But have you ever thought about having a chat with your robot? Social robotics is about creating an environment where our robots become our companions. They could potentially become mentors. But it's about in engaging in a social relationship. With the advances that we've had in technology, we've been able to change the way that we build the robotic systems that we use. Previously, just like all early technologies, it was all about how do we interface to something. You know, is it with a touch screen? Is it with a button? Is it with a sensor? With the increase in processing power, I mean, our, our mobile phones in our pockets today have got unprecedented programming um, capabilities and processing power. But now with all of that capability, we can actually 
start thinking not about how we interface with it, but changing that approach to the way that we interface with it. The majority of smartphones today you can talk to. They'll monitor your face and when you continue to look at the screen they won't bother to dim the screen or turn it off. You can use hand gestures. It becomes a much, much more natural environment. And this is what social robotics is about. It's about building a more natural environment for us to interface with the technology that's available to us. It's basically about building robots that will communicate and function based upon the social behaviours that we define and their role within that social hierarchy. All a bit long-winded. Cute, isn't he? Meet Paro. Paro is a robot seal. Okay? When you stroke him, he wiggles about, he enjoys it. Yeah? If you ignore him, he cries. Okay, And these robot seals have been put into um, hospitals and care homes with patients suffering with dementia. And it allows them to start to build a relationship. And the incredible thing is, is that they build the relationship with the seal as they pet it and care for it. But what they discovered was that the patients started to interact more with each other and that they started to increase the motivation of the, pa of the patients to be part of a group. And they started to see huge, huge benefits. So something as simple as a robot seal can start to bring somebody out. And this all comes down to the fact that as humans, we like to anthropomorphize our technology. We like to give it human characteristics. It's why Siri has a human voice, not a horrible mechanical voice. Yeah? We love to accredit our technology with human characteristics. That brings us on to this little chat that some of you may have seen earlier. This is, uh, this is my friend now. Hello, everyone. Wow, Carl, there are a lot of people here. I hope you don't mess up your talk. Yes, well, thank you for uh, your faith in me. Well, I like to encourage you where I can. I've been working with these types of robots for about five years, but I think probably one of the most exciting experiences that I had with this type of technology was the first time that somebody took me into a school where they were using this with autistic children. And I watched the behaviours and the applications that we'd developed engage children that have communication problems and draw them out and allow them to start to create the skills that they needed to be able to communicate with a normal society as we are today. I was very, very lucky that a lot of this work happened in the UK um, at Topcliffe Primary School in Birmingham and with the support of the Autism Research Centre up at Birmingham University. And Ian Lowe, the headmaster at Topcliffe School, has said that by integrating the robots into their educational program, it's given them another tool that enables them to reach these children in a way that they wouldn't be able to reach them in any other way. Fairly powerful stuff. But this is only the start of social robotics. I've popped my friend Pepper up on the screen. Some of you may have seen Pepper in the news and in the press, but Pepper is actually being used in a number of retail outlets in Japan, where they're acting as an advisor to customers who are wanting to purchase product. So you can actually go into the shop, and rather than speaking to a human shop assistant, you can choose to speak to a robotic shop assistant. And the really interesting part is that to make this work links beautifully back into the video that we were just, were just watching. Because it's all about the elements of emotion and how important emotion is in building our relationships. So Pepper not only can recognise your emotional state and change the way that it responds to you based upon how you feel, 
But if you start to ignore her, she starts to get a little bit upset. So we're starting to build this so that you actually have emotions on both sides to help build a stronger bond. There are a number of products that are going to be released. Um, Cynthia Brazell, who's a, a doctor of social robotics at MIT, has just formed a company and now creating this device called Jibo. And Jibo is designed to be in your home and to act as a social hub for your home. So it will be your message taker. It will tell stories to your kids if, if you're busy. It will be your email client and your social media client. And all of these, these skills aren't the goal. The goal is for this to be the go-to guy in your social environment of your home. And this isn't the only one. There is a, um, we should see Jibo this year. There's a French company that are releasing their own social robot into the same environment with the same ideas, which again are looking to release this this year. These are not going to be expensive devices. These are going to be devices that are going to be under $1,000. And that's, that's kind of where we are today. We're starting to build the technologies that will um, enable us to create almost our own subculture of intelligent, empathetic machines. But before I finish, I just want to touch on what could happen in the future as we move forward. What happens when these artificial, emotionally aware creatures that we're creating start to blur with human beings? Now, that may sound a little bit far-fetched, a little bit science fiction. But I just want to start to, to put this into perspective. The very first football that was kicked in the 2014 World Cup was kicked by a man who was paralyzed from the waist down, who kicked it by wearing a robotic exoskeleton, and he controlled it with his mind. In 2012, a woman had an implant into her brain. She was a quadriplegic. And for the first time in 15 years, she controlled a robotic arm, picked up a cup of coffee, and drank coffee unassisted. Just March this year in Austria, uh, a, a group of patients who had suffered a crushing injury to their arm that had affected the capabilities of them to use their hands were given the opportunity to have the lower part of their arm and their hand removed and have it replaced with a robotic hand. Now, three of those patients did that, and the reports that were announced in March was the fact that with those robotic hands directly connected to their nervous system, they were able to now do up buttons on their shirts and tie their shoelaces. So this is quite incredible technology that can bring huge benefits, allow people suffering from severe di disabilities to live better lives. But the question that I want to leave you to ponder is what happens when the replacement part, the robotic arm or the robotic eye, is better than the one that nature's given us? Would you choose to have a perfectly working part of your body replaced with an artificial part that's better, there will be people that will look at this technology and choose to embrace it. So as we start to think about bringing robots today into our homes that we're imbibing with emotions and emotional capabilities, I believe that we also need to think about what we do with our society as this robotics technology merges into us into our society of human beings, and how the things that we do today could affect the cybernetic society that we start to build tomorrow. Thank you very much.